Now let's talk about how your body produces rotational forces and the impact of projecting an object or oneself. Movement consists of a segment rotating around a joint, or what is called an axis of rotation. The top figure diagrams rotational movement of the arm around the shoulder joint. The figure at the bottom shows a segmental motion of a windmill softball pitch. As you can see, the different phases of motion are characterized by rotation of the upper arm around the shoulder joint. Since this rotation looks similar to the arms on a clock, the timeline at the bottom is marked by different arm positions relative to that of a clock. Limb rotational forces, when in contact with an object, cause an object to be projected into the air in a straight line from the impact or release point. For example, the soccer player rotates his leg around the hip joint. When he contacts the ball, the ball will be projected in a straight line from the point of contact. So the linear velocity of a ball being projected is equal to the radius of rotation, in this case the limb length, times the angular velocity, or the speed with which the limb rotates. To show this another way, on the right I have depicted a circle which has a center point. This could be the joint around which the limb rotates. The black line indicates the radius, which is the distance from the center point to the outside of the circle. This could be considered the limb length. The red arrow along the circle is the angular velocity. The blue arrow is a linear velocity that is tangent to the point of contact. It's a straight line from the point of contact. As you can see, depending on the contact or release point around this rotational motion, the object being projected will move in a straight line from that point of contact. Based on this information, we can think about how we can optimize or improve performance. Let's start by asking, how can you increase linear velocity? For example, how do I increase the velocity of my softball windmill pitch or the velocity of the ball that I kick? Look at the equation. One way to increase linear velocity is to increase the angular velocity. The pictures on the bottom show that without changing the length of the radius, you can increase the angular velocity, again, depicted as red arrows along the circle. You can increase the linear velocity, depicted as a blue arrows tangent to the circle. So, then the question becomes, how do you increase angular velocity? To increase angular velocity, we need to increase the amount of muscle force used to rotate the limb around the joint. This is why soccer players or other athletes do squats and lunges and other strength training exercises to increase their kicking velocity. They increase their muscle mass, which increases the muscle force that's being able to be produced, which in turn increases the linear velocity of the ball being kicked. Now let's think about how development affects object projection. As children grow, their limb lengths increase, and the radius of rotation increases correspondingly. This increases linear velocity. In addition, increases in muscle strength during development will also increase linear velocity. Since we already know that increased angular velocity increases linear velocity based on the previous slide, let's focus now on how growth increases the radius of rotation. The picture at the bottom shows how changing the radius of rotation, the black line, increases the linear velocity, the blue line, even without any change in angular velocity, which is depicted as a red arrow on, along the circle. In addition to growth, let's think about how you can increase the radius of rotation. One common way to increase the radius of rotation is to straighten the limb during movement. For example, during a tennis serve, we must consider two segments, the upper arm and the lower arm. The elbow is another joint that may act as an axis of rotation, so the lower arm can rotate around the elbow in addition to the whole limb rotating around the shoulder. If a person straightens out the elbow, we can create a straight line between the racket and the shoulder, depicted in this cartoon which effectively increases the radius of rotation. The picture on the right shows a cartoon of what this might look like. On the left, the elbow is bent, which means that the effective radius of rotation, or the straight line connecting the shoulder and the racket, is relatively small. This is depicted here as the dashed line. By progressively straightening the arrow, you can increase the effective radius of rotation. In the image on the right, the actual radius of rotation, the solid line, is equivalent to the effective radius of rotation, or the dashed line. 
You may be asking yourself, why do we not always keep our limbs straight throughout the movement if we know that the longer radius of rotation increases the linear velocity of an object being projected? The reason is that our body likes to conserve energy, and it takes a lot of muscle force or energy to overcome the inertia of our arm. Recall Newton's second law. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. The mass in this equation can be called inertial mass. In the context of rotational forces, which are also called torques, the rotational force, or torque, is equal to the rotational inertia times the angular velocity. The rotational inertia is equal to the mass times the radius of rotation squared. So if you have a big radius of rotation, then the rotational inertia will be high. And this means the amount of rotational force or muscle force needed to move the limb around the joint will also be very high. Let's see what this means in practice. If we reduce the radius of rotation, we will reduce the amount of muscle force or energy needed to move the limb around the joint at the beginning of the movement. The figure on the left and the cartoon next to it depict the starting point of a baseball swing. As you can see, the elbows are bent, and this decreases the effective radius of rotation so it will take less energy or muscle force to begin rotating the arm and bat around the shoulder joint. If we increase the radius rotation at the end of the swing, or importantly, at the point of contact, by straightening out the arms, we can increase the linear velocity of the ball off the bat. As you can see in the figure on the right and the corresponding cartoon, the effective radius rotation is bigger at the end of the movement. Another way to optimize performance, in addition to increasing the radius of rotation, is to take advantage of what is called an open kinetic chain. What is meant by this is that the body segments are linked in a chain, and as such, we can generate more force, which will translate into greater linear velocity of the object being projected. In this figure, there is a sequence of movements that begin generating force from the legs, trunk, and arms. The key to optimizing performance is to first, make sure that the sequence of movements create a consistent link and second, the timing of the sequence must be such that there is no lag between links. Let's explore these two concepts. The developmental stages of motor skill learning often involve learning different components or the movement of sets of segments in parts. On the left, we see a child that is working on just the arm motion and upper body flexion to throw the ball. On the right, we see the child learning how to use the lower body in a sequence. First, he takes a step and brings his arm up towards his ear. Next, he brings his upper body backwards during the step. The stepping motion causes a rotation that starts at the hips. Next, his upper body rotates and he begins to start to bring the arm forward. Last, he follows through with his arm, pointing in the direction of the target of interest. Linking each part of the sequence is critical for proper throwing mechanics. Now let's think about the optimal timing of the sequence. If the timing is off, you can lose the benefit of chaining the different body segments or movement components together. As individuals learn a skill, the timing and integration of different body segments and movement components becomes more smooth. Now let's talk about what happens when you project your own body and the forces on your body upon landing. Recall Newton's second law. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. Also recall Newton's third law. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. When you apply a force over a short period of time, you will have a bigger impact. The mathematical definition is actually called work. This is a force times the amount of time for which the force is applied. Work is also called a change in kinetic energy. Upon landing, the kinetic energy is transferred from the ground reaction forces to the body. To reduce the impact of that transfer of kinetic energy, one can increase the time in which the impact occurs, and one can increase the area over which that impact occurs. One way to reduce the impact upon landing is to bend your knees. Bending your knees upon landing will increase the time over which the impact occurs. Bending your knees will also increase the number of body segments or areas over which the force is applied. For example, instead of dissipating the kinetic energy with just the feet, bending the knees allows the impact to be dissipated over the lower and upper legs. Before moving on to the last section, let's recap. 
Movement consists of a segment or multiple segments rotating around a joint. By increasing the radius of rotation, or the angular velocity, one may increase the linear velocity of an object being projected. We can increase the radius of rotation through growth, as well as by maximally straightening out our limbs. The reason why we don't always move with straight limbs is to reduce the rotational inertia, which in turn reduces the amount of muscle force needed to move the limb around the joint. Therefore, we only straighten our limbs at the point of contact. If we optimize our kinetic chain, we can also increase performance. We do this by optimizing the sequence of linked movements and optimize the timing of the sequence of linked movements. Lastly, we learned that in order to reduce the impact upon landing when we project ourselves into the air, we must increase the time in which the impact occurs, as well as increase the area over which that impact occurs.